Hej. Okay, one more minute and we're starting. Let me just drop the agenda to the chat. Ben was on the way. We were in a separate Zoom room, but he's moving over. Oh, cool. That's my fault. I, I forgot that there is a room uh, shared in the invitation. So I thought there is no one. Um, so that's my problem. Item. Okay, um, hey everybody, let's start. Um, welcome to the merge implementers call number two. Um, uh, there are apparently some problems with the Berlin, right? So. But yeah, probably um, some Ethereum core devs can attend this call, but let's just go through the agenda and uh, discuss some items that we can do without them. So, um, okay, so let's start from like the first one. We have this new terminology. Uh, the key uh, replacement here is that we replaced uh, the application term uh, with the execution one. So there is the uh, execution layer instead of the application layer. This is to not um, confuse people uh, with the uh, smart contracts and applications uh, using them. Uh, so applications build on top of um, the mainnet. So that's what's the purpose of it. Uh, also, uh, the term layer is not um, is arguably not uh, the best one for the execution and consensus because they're not uh, actually layered. And uh, yeah, so here we can think more about it. I don't want to spend like much time discussing this, uh, but um, probably it's better to call it subsystems uh, or engines or whatever. Um, and yeah, let's just, if people have any ideas, uh, just drop them uh, in Discord and let's probably discuss it offline. Um, so anything on the terminology? Um, any questions here? Okay, cool. Let's just move on. So the execution discussion, um, I was just going, my, my initial idea was just going through the key um, uh, parts of the execution uh, stuff and uh, ask for some um, updates or for understanding of or probably questions from uh, Ethereum mainnet developers. Um, so that's the initial idea. Um, so probably we can do this anyway. Um, so any questions to the like communication protocol? Where's the most update, updated link um, to the communication protocol? Is that the Ryan is in specs that you're maintaining, Mikhail? Yeah, right. That's the one. Uh, I also put uh, the link to the previous one. Uh, uh, the, the new link, the Ryan is link, is put to the uh, top of the previous document. So that's like the latest one. Anyway, yeah. the yeah. Anyway, this is JSON RPC for Ryanism, but it's not probably. Uh, before production, so we can, yeah, we can, you know, we will anyway get to this discussion later. Um, uh, okay, so who has re reviewed or who has any thoughts or 
suggestions, questions regarding that. Uh, by communication protocol, do you mean ETH1 to communication by RPC or anything else? Um, yeah, so that's, yep. So, uh, okay. Anything so regarding any, uh, yep, any questions? I have a question. Here? So um, I'm not entirely sure how to handle potential issues and error in this protocol for example if the assemble block fails or the new block fails or the set head fails um, because either the payload is wrong or some internal error happened i'm not sure how to handle it the spec doesn't specify it anything about error handling yeah right so there are statuses for um, finalized uh, block set head and for uh obviously for new block. I mean that you can return false if it's not been done correctly. Uh, yeah, you're, you're right, but assemble block doesn't have yeah, this kind of yeah, state. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, That's good awesome. question. Yeah, probably we should add it, you know, some kind of, you know, status there as well. So it will be an object and the status alongside with it. Right, I think, Especially because you can specify the parent hash currently, you can you could point to something that's just bad. So there's definitely a failure case there. Or something that's not existent. Um, uh, also, yeah, the other option is to uh, use the um, errors um, in JSON RPC as we have them today, right? Uh, you mean the result, yeah, and error is in the uh, spec, yeah. yeah. I yeah, was but... thinking about it. Okay. 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 I see. I see the problem. One thing, because I'm not sure if it's specified. It's not explicitly specified. Assemble block doesn't include it. So after assemble block, new block will be called, or do we do we expect that new block won't be called and it we can be called just by set head? Uh, we actually in general expect that a new block will be called. So uh, because um, there is a state transition uh, happening on the um, consensus side when the block is assembled and the uh, it, it's proposed it should yep yeah, it should it, the state transition is uh called triggered and uh, yep yeah, it will trigger the call to to the new block method okay so it's assemble block then new block right yeah. you can like I would pre go ahead danny i was gonna say i would presume git work does not add it into the block tree today, right? Only if they find a solution, uh, does something get added into the block tree? So it's kind of similar logic in that, that sense. Yeah, but in the proof of authority chains, uh, you would generate the block and add it immediately. So that, yeah, yeah, I understand your point here because there is a difference in time. Like when you keep preparing the blocks, with the assemble block, you can potentially even call it many times, right? With the same, uh, with the same parent. Because, can you ever? You could presumably. Um, there's not an immediately obvious use case for that. Um, unless, yeah, it, there's there's not there's not an obvious use case for that. You might like precache a block uh, to not to avoid uh, executing the same transactions once again. Right. You could imagine. Yeah, you could imagine like doing it slightly early to have something ready to broadcast, and then doing it again very close to the time of broadcast to see if you've got a better, you know, Coinbase output on the MEV side. But even then, the I don't know. That that's like not a very clearly good strategy. 
just a potential strategy. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, is parent hash actually a valuable, um, is it worth the complexity here in, in having like you be able to point to anything arbitrarily to build build on rather than just building on the head? Uh, I mean, presumably the beacon node keeps the execution engine in sync with what it thinks is the current head. Um, and so if there were a reorg, you would trigger that and then call symbol block. Uh, I'm just asking primarily, I mean, you, you definitely know the head and can tell the, the parent hash to, to build on, um, but then you're opening up like a functionality requirement on the execution engine to be able to build on arbitrary heads, which I don't know is worth the complexity. Um, that's a good question. So, because it could be the case when there is, the arbitrary like block becomes the head afterwards. I can imagine this kind of stuff, bit racing between uh, a bit of racing between uh, the uh, new head and assemble block. Or um, yeah, so it, what what if the head has changed uh, during the block has been assembled? What should happen here? I mean, even uh, imagine uh, if the head is being changed uh, while the block is being proposed. So this, uh, what will, how will, how will this be handled by the beacon node? I mean, at some point the beacon node has to make a decision about what it's, uh, what it thinks the head is and assemble the block based on that. But the idea would be, I begin assembling a block some other subsystem triggers that there's a new head halfway through me assembling a block. I ask the execution engine for the, the transaction payload, but it's gotten a trigger from somewhere else that there's a new head and now I'm out of sync on that. And this protects against that case. Yeah, some kind of that. Yeah, yeah, I think I consistency I cases, that. oh, sorry, go ahead. No, please, please. Consistency cases are in general really important. Also consider the case where there are multiple beacon nodes talking to the same Ethereum node. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I would say we need to actually think about any concurrent calls to those RPC. So what happens if we had one set head and second set head, we should probably queue them. That's uh, the last one wins, for example, or something like that in the implementations. Right. That's important. Uh, finalized block is probably not important. New block is probably not important that much. But yeah, the relationship between set head and and some of the other calls is maybe important. Yep. So my intuition is that all these messages should be processed sequentially. Uh, um, but uh, what should be, but yeah, new uh, set head and new block are causally dependent. So they must be processed sequentially, but others could be um, processed concurrently. Not sure if, it's, if in all cases it could be done concurrently. All right. Yeah, I mean, I definitely see how a symbol bot and set head, depending on if there's different subsystems in the beacon chain, could get out of sync. And thus, the parent hashes definitely immediately. It's a nice, quick fix without having to think about things deeper, but it might open up complexities on the execution engine side. Um, but I, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, okay, so the assemble block should have some, uh, we have started from the uh, error message. Okay, so let's say, think, let me think about it to continue fine, probably. Okay, um, 
anything else here before we move to folk choice and chain management? Yeah, and I just want to highlight again, like the current, like with that parent hash in there, and there's not really being any bounds on that, like a symbol block could trigger an arbitrary, not reorg because it wouldn't be changing the head, but trigger an arbitrary, like, Attend, like you have to go and, and put yourself into this different state to build a block. And so there might be complexity there and it's worth people investigating that over the next week or two. So we can talk about it again next time. For now, I just raised the error whenever the consistent, consistency check fails. And then from there, we can change implementations to actually handle the case. I have a question. So if we have finalized block, uh, this probably affects what parent hashes can be supplied to con to new block, doesn't it? So we cannot right. reorganize finalized blocks. So we do have some uh, some constraints on this parent hash. Right, right. So ar arbitrary in the sub block tree sense finality. Yeah, but I would not uh, enforce these checks on the execution um engine because this is the responsibility of consensus and in some cases probably there will be the case where um consensus like switches from one finalized checkpoint to the concurrent one um, this is like a case of some forks or whatever so locally locally you'd never revert finality like yeah, even if there was that can't happen finality. Well, it, it can't happen locally. So even if there well, was- Well, it can happen with manual in intervention, right? You might have right. ended up on the wrong fork right. Right. and then you change it. That's, yeah, the node would never do it. Yep, because- uh, So I have a question. So uh, finalized block, how many, uh, how, how much height of the chain might not be finalized yet? I'm not aware of that. Because it's important uh, for state management, pruning, implementations, things like that. That's right. a problem that that is raised here if what I'm uh, aware of in from ETH one side. So practicality of this problem is how big this unfinalized chain could be that we could reorganize. reorganize. Right, so in standard operation, it's two epochs worth, which is uh, 64, Plots uh, that depth, so that's but that's normal operation. So you get in the in the happy case you get pruning on reasonable depths, but you cannot aggressively prune if you're in a time of non-finality, and that you know you could go days without finality. So there's definitely a uh, variance that has to be handled on pruning. So the risk uh, regarding uh, non-finalized state is uh, what happened during uh, Medasha uh, for a couple of days. Uh, the chain didn't finalize and we had many, many forks. And in that case, uh, technically you, are, you can uh, store all the forks uh, in your client because maybe they will become uh, valid. But um, uh, if one fork has only a few votes, uh, that might not be worth it. The problem is what you do if there's a new block that builds on one of those forks. <clears throat> you kind of have to validate that block because you also later need to see if attestations to that block are valid. Uh, so that I think is the problem. But I mean, I would say like on mainnet, like we should definitely be prepared for longer like non-finality periods, but hopefully not days. So maybe we can get a more reasonable compromise there. Um, like days would be pretty extreme. That would be a pretty crazy failure if we ran into that. Okay, so anything else with regard to the protocol of communication between 
access to execution. Okay, cool. Um, let's just move to the folk choice and chain management. I know that people started to investigate in that how hard it would be to um, to make the folk choice pluggable and how big of the impact it has on the um, modifying the chain management of their clients. Um, what I just wanted to ask about any updates and thoughts here, um, how it could be um, improved like from, from any point. So. So maybe I will start from another mind side. It's actually pretty easy. We had it uh, fairly broken down already. Uh, the problem there might be, I haven't investigated that much, is um, later syncing the network uh, up to the head and then starting it. So. Um, Integrating the syncing and the fork choice management itself might be harder uh, than just, but for for starting from head, like for the hackathon we want, it's, it's fairly easy in the domain. Yeah, because for hackathon, we have like this difficulty, total difficulty uh, rule and for, for the beginning. And there was progress on Guff, right? Yeah. I guess I can give an update if there are no uh, folks from Guff on the call. Uh, so, actually, Peter and Guillaume. Oh, there is Peter. Yeah. Peter yes. unmuted and muted a couple times. We can't hear you, Peter, if you've been speaking. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh -oh. Uh, so, if the question was what's Geth's progress on these things, um, yesterday we had a, I think it was yesterday or two days ago, a meeting with Proto. They kind of ran through various stuff. Um, I guess the, um, uh, the conclusion was that if you need something for Monday, then probably the closest we can give you is, uh, is Guillaume's PR, which just kind of hacks into uh, hacks the things into essentially just directly does inserts into the blockchain. It hacks around all the internals. Uh, we started working on um, on uh, um, essentially a new consensus engine, which does the whole new fork choice rule. But um, we haven't merged that in yet, and as far as I know, it's not finalized yet either. Uh, and I've also started working on the synchronization, but. Um, yeah, I'm kind of sidetracked a bit because uh, in order to make the synchronization work, I also need to change some other parts of production get and uh, yeah, I'm not super keen on hacking stuff together in production parts. So, so I just want to make it properly, which means that it's going to take a bit. So those are kind of the updates. Great. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. Peter, if I may ask the PR you're talking about, if this is the PR I've seen, is following the old spec. It's not a big deal, but the JSON RPC interface is different than the new spec. So it's not following the old spec. No, uh, it's yeah, it, it needs some updates, but uh, it will be done after this call. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, any questions to the chain management and the fork choice? Um, okay, so this scene process, it, it's just been some kind of high level proposal in the design, in this high level design doc uh, we discussed on the previous call for how to download the state and do the block sync. Um, if people have any um, like assessment on that, uh, whether it's viable or not, or some any kind of other inputs and things to discuss, yeah, we, we can do it right now.
Okay, cool. So let's just assume that that will work um, and talk later about I it. We, I think we will assume that that's the not people haven't quite gotten there yet. So we should probably yeah. bring it up in the fall or so. Right, agree. I mean, let's just assume for now that it, it may work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, there was a question um, in the chat, uh, in the Discord. I don't remember uh, where exactly was it, probably in Discord. Um, what, uh, uh, which part would decide on the gas limit and target uh, voting, uh, how this will happen after the merge? So my like basic, um, um, my basic thoughts are just it doesn't change. Uh, so the um, execution engine has this um, voting mechanism, and uh, every proposer will be able to um, make this uh, as uh, miners do it now. So any um, any other opinions and thoughts on that? Yeah, I'd say by default it remains exactly the same which is a block producer regardless of whether it's minor proposer or validator it gets, you know does that similarly to how 1559 post merge you know the block producer would be responsible for paying base fee for transaction um, and figuring that out in a similar method i don't know on 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 each one clients today what's the how does one access that? Is it in a, that's not like in the get work function call, right? Is it some sort of setting, uh, configuration setting on the client? From what I remember, like Geth has a flag um, with just a number, which okay. is the target for the gas limit and it will be increased according to the gas limit formula each block. Right. So that should be, that functionality should remain stable and be fine. Yeah. I mean, we can always add methods to, to change it because I mean, it's, it's a relatively small thing, but uh, I don't think it's people generally want to keep tweaking it runtime. But yeah, right. there's there's a reason to be able to tweak the limits runtime. I mean, it's more than trivial. I mean, it's trivial to just add it. Right. And currently, if miner wants to like uh, increase the gas limit, it just restores the node, right? With the new parameter. Yeah. Yeah, but so essentially, if you look at mainnet, um, generally the gas, generally miners always run with the maximum gas limit that was kind of deemed safe for the network and it's not really changed maybe once every half a year or so. So it's not like you need to constantly tweak it. Right. I think yeah, um, uh, after a consensus upgrade, uh, there should be no, there is no reason like to change this. Um, this part. Okay. So one thing um, for uh, the next the next item is just slot clock ticks. Um, this is, I guess, it's been missed like on the previous um, call and in the dog, but I think it could be important because there is the consensus part that has the slot clock. And uh, these ticks uh, should be propagated to the execution, I guess, uh, because uh, the timestamp of these ticks uh, it goes to the block, to the next block, and uh, it's probably important for transactions to that use the timestamp um, of code to be up to date with this kind of information. So it might probably require some additional message or comment. So, uh, so you mean transactions that are sitting in the mempool? They might be right. invalidated or they're not as valuable or, or things because there's logic that's conditioned upon them? Yeah, they may they might change the uh, execute their like uh, execution flow uh, inside of like transaction inside of a smart contract method it calls. And also it could be, it should be important for the uh, pending block functionality because you have to restore it, uh, the block, the 
each time the new timestamp is observed. Mm, could you expand on this thing a bit? So what what is this notion? Um, I feel I'm I'm missing a, something. Yeah, uh, so proof of stake blocks are only the timestamp is dictated by the slot, and the slot is only every twelve seconds. So there's not the granularity of the time. Like you would never see a you know transactions that are hitting timestamp opcode that's not on those twelve second boundaries. Um, so it. Okay. The execution engine can know about time and can decide what slot it is uh, and kind of use that, or it can be told about time and use that. Okay, but then essentially this would mean that uh, the ETH1 blocks should uh, also hit the same 12 seconds. Correct. Okay. But on I, a so I guess when, when you when you call produce block or I'm not, whatever it's called, you would specify the timestamp to produce it at, wouldn't you? Correct, correct. Okay. But no, this so is more of, uh, I think Mikhail's concerned, like when you call produce block, you give the timestamp and that's fine. It gives you a deterministic result. I think Mikhail is worried about systems that are maybe dependent on timestamp that aren't right at the granularity of produce block, like managing the mempool and things. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I guess the, the only thing I wanted to, the reason I kind of uh, got hung up on this and wanted to emphasize is that uh, anything that transaction execution depends on needs to be crammed into the block header, because otherwise we cannot uh, synchronize fast blocks. Right. So you can add, so we've, um, I think we've discussed it with Guillaume a couple days ago that the original RPC APIs also had this uh, Randall thing plus some second field. Right. Uh, which at least in the, in the past API, they were just passed along as two more fields independent of the block. And I just wanted to ask that uh, if we want to ever add those fields back, then we probably need to get them integrated into the header. And since with the header, I think with this minimal merge spec, uh, we've nuked out three, four fields, for example, the mixed digest and others, we can always repurpose them to, if we want to have them in with minimal damage to the, I mean, minimal changes to the ETH1 clients. Right. So There's not the, really, sorry. because of the timestamp field, the timestamp field consistency with the slot can be checked on the consensus side and the beginner side. So it's not really, I don't think you really need to get another field in there. Um, I think Mikhail is more concerned about the execution engine knowing what slot it is without the context of being a new block being called. And so it can make decisions about things like the mempool. Yeah. So like my, my question uh, was like how to mempool transactions are executed uh, against which block is it dependent block that is created and restored at each time after the new one is received from the wire after the new block is received and imported i'm not following what that question uh, so the question a, is, you, you have to very validate the transaction, right? Uh, before propagating it to the wire, right? No, no, not really. So when you get a transaction, you only check whether the sender has enough balance that the knot is correct. Ah, okay. okay so you don't execute it. Uh, and uh, yeah, okay, I get it. And for the dependent block, uh, it matters which timestamp is used, right? So for the pending block, um, Yes, I guess uh, the question is whether there's uh, so if you want to enforce this 12, um, 12 second uh, thing, then possibly it would make sense to somehow introduce into the consensus engine a, a rule to that the timestamps for the pending block would be again on this 12 second boundary. But I guess that's an important spec question. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, calls to a symbol block are only going to ever be on that 12 second boundary. And so any anything opportunistic like the pending block should respect that. And then there's a question of 
can the execution engine just use its local time mod these 12 second boundaries or should it be told explicitly on like a click from the beacon node okay new slot okay new slot okay new slot so it doesn't have to worry about time sync issues no i think it's safer to just let the let the pen i mean you don't really care what the real world time is you only care that it's in sync with your 12 second click right and the pending block is either way just some opportunistic let's try to execute a batch of transactions and see what happens but it's so the worry would be if i had the beacon node and the execution engine on a separate machine and the pending block becomes is like one second off and so it's a slightly different slot and so when i actually call a symbol block the pending block's not as useful to me that would be the that would be the reason for the beacon node clicking you know ticking uh on that boundary so that they would be in sync yeah so i honestly i think so in in get if you don't if you are not mining then you are creating these pending blocks and if you are mining then you are not creating these pending blocks rather you are you you are specifically creating mining blocks which are a bit different and handle differently so uh, so for validate so for, for average nodes they would just try to guess the next time slot okay. and, that, and they they won't care about they they won't ever get called to finalize something and for miners uh, well yeah i guess i guess for miners you won't really poke at the pending block because you just want you just wait for the next thing right but what is the pending block used for when it's for non mining nodes uh, honestly i think it's useless <laughs> uh, yeah, I was like thinking that pending block is used by miners. So, so if the reason I, I would say that it's useless is because uh, you have four thousand transactions in the pool, or or maybe even larger if you count other bigger pools, and miners will pick a few. So, your local node sees four thousand transactions, picks two hundred to execute, and then you can check the result, but even if you swap two of them, which are doing some Uniswap things, mm -hmm. then you will get wildly different results. So I don't really think you can trust the, the results in the pending pool. It's, it was some- how, how is this exposed to users today? Like the pending block thing? The pending block is you can just query the pending state. So you could, instead of okay. getting the balance of the current, status of the network, you can query the balance of the pending state. But as I said, it's not really useful. Right. The only um, reason, I, I, okay. sorry, just one more thing to add. The only reason we didn't uh, really push for getting rid of the pending block is because it acts as this nice little caching layer, meaning that uh, I have my, I'm maintaining the list of transactions that I think will get included in the network. I pick 200 best, I run them as a pending block but there's a fairly high chance that out of those 200 maybe 150 uh, will actually land in the next block so by the time i start executing those 150 at least the all the storage slots that it touches are already hot in memory okay so, so we keep the free cache yeah okay so it keeps your cache a little bit more a little hotter but the got it so if you if you want to if you want to keep that functionality, we pretty much just need to have the execution engine respect uh, mod twelve second timestamps, and and then I think you get most of the functionality of, of today with no problem. And even then, even if you didn't, you probably get most of the functionality because most things probably aren't calling the timestamp output. Yeah. So I guess the only request that I would have is that if there's this specific um, behavior that. Uh, Every block will be on the, on the twice on the five second mark. Perhaps just add it to the spec that this is to be right. expected. Plus, uh, it is expected that pending blocks should behave accordingly. Okay. Excellent. Cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, also, I was thinking that pending block might be useful for applications that send some transaction and just get read them from their uh, from the nodes they are hosted to. to to send transactions. I mean, this pending block to read the pending state. Um, okay, anyway, uh, by the way, then, uh, what is the uh, functionality that is used for miners? Is it just creating a block from scratch or anything else? 
well, gas is a bit. Um, that's that's a good question. So because gas currently creates during a single mining cycle, it recreates a block multiple times. First, it creates an empty block, empty block, then it fills it, then it tries to create better blocks with different transactions, and all of them can be mined. So it's uh, this is uh, with the proof of work network. With, with click, uh, you just create the block whenever you get request to the block. So I guess for uh, for, for the ETH2 mergers perspective, one option that we could do is to just wait for the ETH2 client to ask for a block and then we just run the transactions. The only issue is that then it will take I don't know, half a second or however much it takes to mine it, to create a block from scratch. Or the other alternative is to try to prepare a few blocks in advance by guessing the timestamp. And then when you request it, we just give you the best one and we, it will return instantaneously. Right. Yeah, I guess this like time uh, ticks will be like input for this kind of optimization as well. Yeah, so either work. <clears throat> and if there were that like known five and a half a second delay, uh to be expected then the proposer essentially would bef before they're supposed to broadcast right at that slot boundary they would call it early to be able to pack the block uh but if it's doing the pre-packing then it can call it later um yeah i was like thinking about just sending not only current uh, timestamp right but also the timestamp of the next slot to 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 fit this kind of uh, functionality which prepare the block in advance. Okay, cool. Um, let's just, yeah, I'll think about it more. I um, mean, and probably add this to the specification as a separate message. But wait, why would you need a separate message? So you are sending us uh, new blocks anyway, and the new blocks are supposedly on the correct time slot. So I can just add 12 seconds to that. It's not probably, no, it, it could be that the new block is like from the, from the past. It's not like what always. No. Well, yeah, but I mean, so if, if, you, if the each 2 chain accurately uh, tracks the 12 second mark, every block's on a 12 second mark, then I can just calculate which will be the next 12 second mark based on on my chain head or and the current time so i don't think that's a problem yeah. um, and again but what, there is when you give me produce block request and i have to remake the block if you make sure you also account for a gap slot then that will probably work yeah 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 if it's just based on time that would I mean, I would like add like a separate message, uh, which just sends the time, this time update. And I think it's just extra. So in the first yeah. round, you would probably not even try to be smart, rather just whenever the miner says, whenever the two client says it wants a block, I can just make a block and low waiting 500 milliseconds acceptable. Actually, um, is it acceptable? So what? Ha so if uh, if two client wants me to make a block, what's the procedure? What's the timeout? How? What is the expected propagation time, creation time, etc.? The expected is to begin propagation at that uh, boundary, and so sometimes there's like a little bit of pre-work done because you know that you're about to propose. Um, and then propagation should happen in that sub second on normal operation. So if there were latencies, expected latencies in producing a block, you would just start your work a little bit early. Yeah, but so uh, let's say there, it, it takes me half a second. Let's say it takes me one second to produce a block. Right. How does that influence the E2 uh, consensus? Does it matter if it takes one second or not? If I wait until the slot boundary and it takes one second, as long as I still have one to two second 
uh, propagation for the full network, it's still fine. Uh, you're looking for like sub four second between when I'm beginning my job and when it when you get full propagation. But the uh, if if there were delays from getting the block that took you know a second, then I as a block produce, producer would just start my job early, such that at the beginning of the slot I have the block prepared, rather than waiting to the beginning of the slot and then not only not having the block prepared until one sec second later. Yeah, so I mean, if, I, I don't think that it's, uh, it's a good idea to make the each client smart one. What I meant is that it takes one second is depending on how many transactions I cram in and uh, it might take less or more. So it's, I'm just asking about the worst case scenario that if, if, if I take one second, what happens? Does that break consensus? Does that break block production or is it just a bit unpleasant? It likely is fine. Uh, if you're taking two or three seconds, it begins to not be fine. Why would you not take, I mean, I guess my assumption is what a miner does is they just continuously process, uh, make new blocks and always whenever they have the block available, they start um, mining on that. Um, can't you do like a similar approach that you start making blocks from maybe four seconds before your slot time. And whenever you're done, you start making the next block with the latest information and send the current one to the beacon node so that it can immediately make a block if it's uh, yeah, yeah, so that's, at the slot time. And of course, that's yeah. the option choice. Uh, I was just referring to, to the case if, the, if I make a block with a certain timestamp and it turns out that the, the actual timestamp, the validated request from me is different, then I have to remake the block. Oh no, but the validator would always request the block with a timestamp of the time when it actually has a slot. Like that's determined, like, well, Correct. at that time it's deterministic. Like yeah, you already you know imagine, the exact timestamp. You could imagine time sync between the beacon node and the execution engine being three seconds off or something like that. Right, so the but can't the beacon node just say what exact timestamp it wants? That's what Mick, well, yes, 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 yes. So, but if the execution engine was opportunistically creating blocks for the slightly wrong timestamp and thus the wrong ah. slot, then once you ask- for No, it, it shouldn't do that. I mean, what my assumption would be that beacon nodes knows a block is coming up, tells the execution engine, uh, say like, I don't know, six seconds before, and then the execution right. engine starts making blocks with that timestamp which would then still be a few seconds in the future, but that doesn't matter. Sure. So in the current in the current functionality, you could just make the assemble block call multiple times leading up and just take the yes. best one. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. The, later, the last one you can get basically. The last one, yeah. That would give you hopefully more fees. Yeah. But re regardless, I don't think that we need a, an additional message that says, hey, this is the slot. Hey, this is the slot. Hey, this yeah, is the yeah, slot. yeah, right. I get it. I get it. Okay, so that's just it. Yeah. Okay, cool. And Lucas, uh, but there's so, definitely like things to optimize on this and think about uh, between communication. Uh, so what I wanted to say is that I wouldn't put too much constraints in the spec on how much long it would it should take to produce the block. Okay, of course we can put some uh, max value that we expect because I would consider this implementation detail that is can also vary uh, for example on hardware so depending on your hardware it can take longer or shorter to to produce a block so if I was implementing ETF2 uh, I would do like you suggested. So ask for a block as soon as I know we can ask for is for a block, and then later re-ask for a block if if possible. And that's that's how I would um, advise. Well, or yeah, uh, instead of uh, having a single method saying give me a block, and then the one client has to scatter to make a block, you can uh, split it into two methods. Just calling it prepare block, which says I'm going to ask for a block with this specific timestamp in the next whatever time. And then the ETH2 client can try to make the best block possible. And then when you actually request the block, 
I will give you back whatever the best is I have. But that's right. Instead of having to having to poll on that one message, you just say start working. I'll ask you in a bit. Yeah. So the problem with the poll is that you ask for for a block, but I don't know. Should I make better ones? Should I stop? Will you request once or twice or three hundred times or what happens? So poll is a bit unpredictable. Whereas if you make two calls, then at least I know that okay. I gave you my best block. I can throw away all the all that scratch work because it won't be used anymore. Yeah, that's interesting. That's maybe reasonable. I think I think I think, uh, I think you can reproduce that with pull as well. Like you just like the if two node just uh, pulls and then what, whenever it gets a block, it just immediately starts the next request and uses the last one it got from that sequence. Yeah. Um, right, I, but I mean, the, the execution engine doesn't know when to stop the optimization. Well, it would so. because you stop making, um, I guess sure. it produces yeah. potentially one more block than necessary, I guess, like that would be <laughs> the only downside, but I, that, that doesn't seem huge. I don't think that's the case. But it's, it's a what, constant fix, yeah. Uh, so currently what GET does is that, I so when I start mining proof of work network, I create a block, I give, give it to the miners to start crunching on it, but then some more transactions arrive and I assemble a new block that's better. So I gave that new, give that new block to the miners and then some new transactions arrive and then I create a third block. And I will keep doing this until something comes in from the network. And if nothing comes in from the network, I will create a gazillion work packages until something gets mined. All right. So it's a continuous optimization. It's not just discrete, make a, make a next block. Um, yeah, so essentially every time the transaction arrives, there's a possibility that I can make a better block. Right. So that's why I need a, a signal to stop making new blocks. Maybe that signal would be a set head. That would also work. Well, and uh, one signal could also be if the, if the execution engine is like more than a slot past the last calls for the slot, you know that no one's going to be asking for it, even if there's like some sort of time discrepancy. But then you're starting to make assumptions about time and the relationship between the two, which is probably not great. Yeah, so I guess this is a kind of an open question for probably for us first spec, I would say that just ask for it once. And if I have a block, I will give it to you. And if not, then I will make one and give it to you. And as long as it's fast enough, it shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, great. So it's now much more clear, at least for me now. Um, okay, so I guess we can move on to the consensus engine, to the consensus layer. I have like a few things to discuss here and then there are any some updates. Uh, okay, so uh, the first thing for consensus is that there is an idea of the improved, uh, an improved transition process, which is like basically we have a transition epoch um, and when the epoch uh, happens, uh, the no, uh, consensus node uh, decides on what will be the total difficulty um, uh, of the transition, the transition total difficulty. Um, it could be done like uh, take the current, take the difficulty of the most recent block, multiply, multiply it by 10 or and uh, set uh, this, as the offset for this the total difficulty I mean to compute these total difficulty that will be happen in the future. What it's is great about it? Take, yep. take the latest ETH1 data because that's known to be yeah. consistent across the client. Right, that, that what I was like going to ask, uh, which one to use uh, because uh, if, if we like take the most recent block, it will have to be some some kind of agreed by everybody, and that requires some additional agreement process procedure. But we already have this ETH1 data voting, so that could be. You can do the first new ETH1 data after the transition epoch. Right. So, uh, the, like when transition epoch happens, uh, yeah, the first, um, um, yeah. So the ETH1 data that are in the state, right? We can use this block hash and get the difficulty and uh, add the difficulty to mm -hmm. 
to the most recent block probably yeah so there yeah, actually the why why is this a good idea is because we have um the exact point in time uh, with no regard to what difficulty will be on the network um and uh, we have this kind of total difficulty mechanism preserved uh, which has its benefits Right. And transition epoch is essentially that is a beacon chain fork because that's the point at which you change the data structures to support the execution payload, even though they're empty. And so essentially there is a lead time, there's a fork that actually happens. The 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 fork happens, the actual change and update of the consensus code happens with a lead time before the actual transition and puts the, the new code in place, and then the transition happens. And so doing it as a function of that dynamically i think makes sense because uh, it also just removes like another thing miners can potentially play with like if 75 percent of the miners go offline you know you, you they don't delay the the transition uh by like timing and different things like that that much yeah so the open question here uh, is that how to compute this transition total difficulty what to use so we can think about it and get to this discussion. I will also think about how to do it, like what uh, potential ways of doing it we have um, with, rela with relation to the inputs that we already have, like in the beacon state and the beacon block, and uh, those that we can get from the execution engine. Yeah, I guess the actual worst case in hard coding it uh, rather than doing it as a function of, at this transition epoch is that you uh, the the beacon chain fork that adds the new functionality like if you set the total difficulty some say three months ahead and miners actually sped things up which is obviously difficult and unlikely but if they sped things up and made the transition total difficulty happen prior to the actual forking of the code uh, and this prevents that that kind of crazy case from happening Any questions to this um, transition process? Okay, cool. Um, the other thing to discuss is the execution payload size, which is like the biggest uh, um, field here is transactions, which has the max size uh, um, up to 16 gigabytes at the moment. This is because we have to like handle two, two different cases where there are a few uh, transactions with like huge transaction data and a lot of transactions with like no transaction data. Um, that's why this, uh, and there are two limits, um, like basically on the, uh, number of bytes of each transaction and number of transactions. So that's why this uh, 16 gigabyte is theoretically possible. And the um, potential. Can I add um, some context? Yeah, uh, the sure. SSD, SSD uh, lists have a max size because this uh, comes into play in the structure of uh, the Merkleization rules and like the, the structure of the tree. And so max like these things all have to have a, a, a max size and thus when you take the max size of the byte payload and max number of transactions currently then you get some ridiculous number like Mikhail says. so this might be a bit uh, unrelated but uh, maybe not uh, so the that peer-to-peer -peer itself also has um, a uh, cap on the message size. That cap is, as far as I know, 16 megabytes, but uh, at least GAT limits the ETH subworld packages to 10 megabytes. This means that if somebody mines uh, an 11 megabyte block, then GAT will not be able to propagate. If somebody mines a 20 megabyte block, Ethereum 1 clients will not be able to propagate it with the current specs. That doesn't mean we cannot update it, fix it, extend it. It's just a uh, mental note gotcha. yeah i think like this is the way to 
limit this kind of stuff like on the network um like by yeah. just limiting the gossip message size yeah i was gonna say on the the beacon block um uh, gossip limits you can or gossip validation conditions you can definitely handle it there um based off of maybe a function of like gas limit and stuff and, and, check. and we already have this kind of limits right in the gossip I mean, we do have validation conditions, yeah. And you could add this very easily. One more thing to keep in mind is that at least uh, with the ETH1 network, we've kind of seen that uh, unless you have a very, very beefy connection, aka Amazon, um, <laughs> if you have, so for, for SnapSync, we are using uh, half a megabyte packets. And uh, I can request packets from quite a lot of peers simultaneously. And actually, we've managed to overload the local node with. Uh, so we've managed to uh, have timeouts, not because the remote node isn't sending us the data fast enough, rather because we just uh, overload our own inbound bandwidth with data. And it just takes that much amount of time to get it through. So. Um, in, in essence, what I was saying is that once you get to this half a megabyte message size, it things get funky. Gotcha. So again, I don't know what the what the long term goals are on how to scale things, but uh, you we also need, probably need to take to keep in mind that um, network messages should be somewhat meaningful in size. Okay, so get it. The the option you have is to limit it on gossip. Also, um, the gas limit should work, but um, yeah, I don't think like this is the the gas limit will be anyway checked uh, after the message is received. And if there is like a six sixteen gigabyte message, nobody wants to download it. So it makes sense, it makes a lot of sense to refuse uh, to to get just refuse these kind of things on the net, on the gossip the network stack. Agreed. Okay, cool. Uh, the next thing is um, specific to the structures to the execution payload. We have the we are going to have uh, like multiple transaction types right on the main app. Yeah, or we, we already have them uh, since Berlin. Um, so like the, um, the default option for the uh, consensus side is not to cope with uh, these different transaction types um, and just use this uh, opaque, opaque transaction uh, approach, which is just the Representing transaction as an RLP string, um, and just which is for con from consensus standpoint is just a string of bytes, um, and have like this and introduce. Uh, this is what it's already done, but uh, we can also introduce the union type with like a box selector, which will be only one, uh, which will allow for now only one type. Uh, this uh, string of uh, bytes, uh, but will give us some forward compatibility with the, the next updates when we is decide to like uh, stem from a pack transaction and have them explicitly in the execution payload. That was the idea, right? Yeah, that's the idea. Uh, the idea being that you can, <clears throat> as you add transaction type structure in the SSZ payload and get a little bit nice proof nicer proof structure rather than having just the opaque RLP byteload. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but that for simplicity, we can do opaque selector for now. And then uh, in the future, deprecate opaque selector with uh, specific selectors. Um, I think this is an idea from Proto. Proto, do you have anything to add? Uh, right. So the current SSE spec defines a union type. 
we do not use the union type, but we can still improve it. And what we would basically do is define it as a single prefix byte to the transaction. Um, and then we define a single selector for the upback transaction for all the existing types in their encoded form. And then I'm talking about the envelope, including the inner selector that applies to the Ethereum 1 uh, data. But then outside of that, we would like the structured data for nice Merkle proofs. And for this, we would like to define other options in the union that are more structured with SSC. And then we get this second byte that's also kind of like a selector that applies to all the new types of transactions after the merge. So I think we just should do this at some point in time. So. I don't think anything to discuss with this regard uh, here. So if anyone, anyone wants to, if anyone have a, any opinion, just yeah, let's discuss it offline. And like the last, the, the last item is the UN256 uh, in the beacon chain stack, which is used for total difficulty, which is like now, um, it's about 72 bytes. I don't remember value, well, which is, uh, like just exceeds the UN UN sixty four, and we have to use some something bigger. Um, so what options here? Uh, first is not eliminating it at all, and just uh, because it's not used in any arithmetics except for comparison. So it's just this spec compares uh, whether the transition total difficulty already happened or not, um, and yeah, that could be handled. Uh, the other option would be to, uh, I don't know, to denominate it somehow, but that would probably require some denomination happening on the um, execution engine side because it returns the total difficulty. I don't think it's like, mm, probably it, it, yeah, it would work, but yeah, it just requires additional, um, additional work. I'm not sure which, which way like it's better. Sure, I think I missed that. You're looking for an encoding for a big integer in EVE2? Uh, no, essentially, we, we've avoided big int arithmetic in EVE2 on the node side so far. Um, and right now, with total difficulty, there is a big int yes, all of a sudden. Right, but it's not going to be encoded. It's just, you know, um, got from the execution engine, compare it to, to the constant. Um, yeah, it's not, I mean, it's not going to be encoded in um, SSD structures. Sorry, I don't understand. Execution engine returns somewhere total difficulty to the consensus engine? Right. Uh, this is required for transition process, for okay. transition procedure. So the transition uh, like happens once the a certain total difficulty is is reached. Mm -hmm. And right now, the beacon node literally just does not have big int arithmetic. <laughs> and so you could, the the total difficulty could be denominated in a UN64 and take off a bunch of the um, precision. And you'd also have to have a function uh, that returns that with uh, the less and precision. Yeah, so like the question is how difficult it will it will be to implement the 56 on the big and chain side. That's like it. If it's not too difficult, I would not, uh, I would like leave it there. Any two clients wanna speak up? Um, Terry from Prism here. Uh, it's not too difficult for us to change, and uh, we do use speaking at some places. Yeah, for Teku, I don't see it being difficult. We already have uh, big int for if one 
in this, so we can change it. Cool. Let's uh, ask the Lighthouse folks too, but let's just operate as though we can do a big end comparison for this one little thing, um, unless we hear otherwise. Yeah, great. Yeah, so let's just yeah keep it as it is. And if there will be a problem, actually, we can change it. Um, okay. Well, so, with the proper encoding, you can do a byte for byte encoding uh, comparison if it's just for order. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, but you will receive it uh, from like why uh, in in JSON format, I guess. Yeah, but you can. I see. You if it right has now. encoded, yep. yep. You can like even compare compare it as like uh, lexicographical, right? At, if it's at, like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. in hexadecimal form, maybe, but uh, otherwise, uh, it's more tricky. I think. Okay. Cool. Anyway, uh, okay, uh, we have like 15 minutes. Let's go to Rainer's and updates. Um, so Proto, do you want to, sorry? Sure. So um, in the past week or so, we have had a few of these office hour type of calls, which are more casual calls where you can stay in sync with the very bleeding edge of Rayanism. I'll give a summary of what we have done so far. Um, so we looked at the first DevNet in how to prepare the genesis and then um, also chatted with a few clients on like how we move forward with the RPC. And so we have this one genesis tool ready to go uh, to prepare a testnet with. We have a guide for everyone who would like to set up their own testnets, how to use this kind of thing. And, um, I think we should basically try and focus on the RPC, um, on the updating to the latest spec, and then we are ready for the first prototype DevNet. Thanks, Rado. Um, I would just go through like client updates um, on where everybody are uh, on the with regard to Rayanism. Um, yep, so. Maybe we can start like from Geth. Well, I kind of uh, gave an update uh, at the beginning of the thing. So essentially, the first uh, first version was the decision was that uh, uh, we're going we're keeping Guillaume's uh, API updated to I mean it would be changed and updated to to confirm to whatever spec the current API is. But otherwise, it will still be based on directly just injecting data into the chain. Anything else? Yeah, great. Um, never mind. So uh, we have an initial implementation that I am currently testing. I hope I will finish testing and stab stabilizing it by tomorrow. And if any of ETH2 clients would like to participate in testing integration with the RPC, I, uh, please contact me. I would be very happy to work on something like that, for example, tomorrow. So if anyone is available for that, that would great. be great. Um, probably you have any any guide how to run the other mind in Rayanism mode. Uh, yes, I can write something tomorrow, but I would like to, you know, just experiment that um, I didn't like uh, miss something in the spec and we can I can communicate with an ETH to note if anyone has this kind of test set, set up or something. Cool. Yeah, great. So uh, actually work on like Taku and I'm uh, gonna to you. It's gonna be ready tomorrow. So I guess I can experiment with Catalyst and uh, with Nethermind as well. So just reach out. 
Yeah, cool. Thanks. Anybody from like Open Ethereum, Tur Turbo Gap, um, Bazoo? I know Bazoo is starting to work on on the spec as well. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, let's just yeah go to the consensus um, clients. We can we can uh, we can we can change clients. So as I said, that I'm working on Teku. Um, should be like ready by tomorrow, I guess. Uh, we'll test it with um, Catalyst first, then try another mind. Probably anybody else through, but yeah, I know what their status is. Um, uh, so, uh, what about Prismatic? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm still not much progress on the API side from my end. I'm still reviewing the changes. So I think once the API becomes more formalized on the e one side, it probably take me a day to catch up. So that's not too bad. Other than that, um, we built a faucet and for uh, Renism, it's fully configurable. It comes with a ready React and Angular uh, project as a reference. It's also authorized. So hopefully that could be useful. And then we also created a guide uh, to start up to, to basically start prison for um, rainism. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for this whole set um, service. All integrated, I guess, in the first DevNet. I'm just dropping the, the guide on how to run prison yeah, that people have mentioned. Okay, um, Nimbus. Uh, Nimbus, do you have any updates with regard to Rainy's? We're working on, uh, <clears throat> we've just started working on uh, Ryanism. Uh, we have a PR. Um, but uh, it, at this point, um, we are experimenting with Catalyst, but it's not clear we'll be ready for the first uh, testnet. That's our goal. Uh, we still have a little bit more work to do in the RPC interface between uh, Nimbus and Catalyst. Okay, great. Um, anybody from my uh, from my house? Nobody is here. Um, anyone else want to give the uh, an update? Okay, great. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, I have a question, not an update, yep. if, if possible. Um, can you uh, give a rough estimate on the dates and plan for the DevNet? Sure. So the original idea was to start the DevNet somewhere in the first week of the hackathon. Um, just it's experimental, short lived, and it's like, okay, if you join later or, or otherwise. However, this is this kind of opportunity where we just look at, can we try the RPC in something in more of a shared DevNet? And so I just like to try and spin up whatever kind of prototype we have in like in the next week or so. Um, and I have this example configuration for the first DevNet up in the Realism repository. I'll share the link again uh, in the chat. And there um, I specify Monday as the uh, the Ethereum 1 uh, genesis, and this can be skipped. And then Wednesday as the actual genesis. So there's this delay of knowing the exact genesis state of Ethereum 1. And then from there, you can compute the one for Ethereum 2. And then on Wednesday, the actual like chain event where the first slot starts uh, ticking. Um, but this is 
purely as example right now. Like I need, I would like to confirm this. Um, I probably wait for one or two more office hour calls for to to learn about the readiness of clients. Thank you very much. Okay, any any questions? Any more questions with regard to Rayanism? Cool. Any other discussions, questions, or um, announcements? Anything else before we wrap up? Great. Um, I'm sorry for screwing up the call, uh, this Zoom, Zoom link, or uh, will fix that. Um, so, okay. Thank you so much for coming. See you tomorrow, uh, next week, next month, um, every time. So. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.